I'm just coming to support my boy. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, this is the eighth edition of our In Conversation With series that we've been running since March this year. A very warm welcome to Caroline Ewerton, the Head of Operational Delivery at The Zone. And thank you for that uh, very upbeat and inspirational video that kicked off uh, this session. A welcome also to all our RISE and IABM members who are on uh, the webinar this morning from the UK and around the world. And we also have uh, quite a few new attendees uh, this week that are joining for the first time. So welcome to everyone who's on the call. Caroline and I will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll have an open Q&A with the audience. So please feel free to enter into the Q&A any questions that you might have uh, during our conversation and then we'll be happy to take them uh, towards the end of the hour. So Caroline, uh, a very warm welcome to you. We're going to start off with questions so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, where were you born? Hi, Anna. I was actually born in the Amazon region of Brazil in a place called Manaus, which is a city uh, with about two million people with shopping centers and builders and all kinds of things, but right in the heart of the jungle. So I don't think... And what country... So I say that again. Wonderful. And what countries have you lived in throughout your life to date? Actually, I think I can say I've been I've been around a bit. So uh, I moved to the UK when I was seventeen, actually. So initially to learn English on my own, it was only supposed to be a, a nine month English course. Uh, very young, just as I left school. Um, living with uh, what we call a host family and other international students, and that was about 24 years ago. <laughs> a lot has happened <laughs> since then. Uh, I spent most of my adult life in the UK. Then uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. Ended up going to South Africa to run a business for a while. Uh, also moved back to Brazil for a short while, then ended up coming back to London. So, uh, yeah, I think I've been in three different continents in the past 24 years. <laughs> And happy birthday, because you had your birthday recently. So hope you were able to do something fun to celebrate. Uh, what you. languages do you speak? After all those uh, uh, trips around the world, what languages do you speak? So obviously I'm a native speaker of Portuguese, which is the language that I speak in Brazil. Uh, I sort of been living in the UK for a long time. So uh, English has become my sort of um, uh, the second home language. Uh, also ended up learning Italian along the way. So I speak Italian as well uh, and, and Spanish, not as well as um, English and Portuguese, but it's something that being from South America, being from Brazil, you learn something called Portuñol, which is basically a combination of uh, Spanish and Portuguese. And I'm sure with uh, the Zone's international business, that actually is quite helpful for your career as well as uh, your your uh, personal travel. Uh, what's your favorite food? What's my favorite food? Okay, so I think if you had asked me that question about four months ago, my answer would have been very different. But in February, I actually made a decision to go vegan. So I've been toying with the idea of going vegan for a while. Uh, I used to take sort of 
breaks from eating whatever normal food I was eating at the time. I was never a big fan of meat, even though being Brazilian, that's quite unusual. <laughs> I, was, I was more keen on fish. And then naturally, I just felt like my body started making the, the, the transition to veganism. So to be honest, originally, I, I did it more for health reasons because I thought they made me feel better. But now uh, I've adopted the, the vegan lifestyle more fully. And uh, I think I'm doing it for ethical reasons as well. So my favorite food at the moment, I would say, is probably evolving. You know, I'm still learning. I became vegan during the lockdown as well, meaning that <laughs> I didn't have an opportunity to visit many vegan restaurants. I'm lucky enough to have a partner who works up, cooks amazingly well and, and works with food. So we are kind of exploring uh, a vegan menu uh, to be able to come up with more exciting ideas. So right now, I would say it would have to be anything vegan. As long as it's tasty, then, then that would be my favorite dish. Thank you. And what's your favorite music? My favorite music, I would say right now, in times of lockdown, I think because there is so much latent anxiety that we don't normally acknowledge, but it's there. I've been listening to quite a lot of piano in the background. And I think uh, the reason for that as well is that my next door neighbor has recently bought a piano and uh, she's still learning. So that can be a little bit tricky <laughs> to hear all that. So to be able to mask the sound of the piano lessons away, I've been listening to an awful lot of uh, calm piano music myself on the background as well. So whenever I'm not on calls, which to be honest, takes up quite a lot of my day, or on the evening weekends, you you listen, you hear me listen to piano playlists, just to sort of keep the peace with the neighbor. So the sounds blend in the background and, and also just, just sort of keep everything calm at home as well. So what is your favorite music, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I would have to say probably a combination of reggae and rap. Oh, wow, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> now, both of us work in the sports business. So what is your favorite sport to play or exercise that you do? Okay, so I have to say, being Brazilian, I would have to say that my favorite sport is football because that's in my DNA and, you know, and that will never disappear. And also spending most of my adult life in the UK, I have to say that that, that tradition carried on. Uh, I'm not the best sports person in the world, I'll be honest. I kind of... Uh, used to play a little bit of basketball and volleyball when I was younger. It's not something I have carried into my adult life. However, what I have uh, sort of discovered during the lockdown is I love jogging. So I actually started uh, only about, I would say about six weeks ago. So I've been going every other day. So that's kind of actually uh, working up in me the desire to be more active from my sports perspective, as in me doing watching or anything. So uh, I'm actually looking at signing up for tennis lessons at the moment as well. So who would know? I never thought that in my 40s I would discover a love for sports that was perhaps never there as a kid. So I would say, yes, yeah. so jogging at the moment and, and hoping to learn tennis uh, at some point in the near future. Good luck with your tennis lessons. And when you turn on the television or open up your device to watch sports, what's your go-to sport to watch? I would say it has to be football. Yeah, that's that's got to be football. I think it's for many reasons. One, because it's it's what I was brought up watching and then coming to the UK as well, seeing that law for sport. But obviously uh, being part of the zone and having access to a wide range of, uh, of sports on the platforms has certainly opened my eyes to be able to, uh, to maybe start embracing and watching stuff that I normally wouldn't. And of course, uh, all of us from the Antipodes, Australia and New Zealand, are absolutely wrapped that the next Women's World Cup will be down under. So that was absolutely fantastic news. And hopefully the world will come to Australia and New Zealand in 2023 to watch a lot of uh, women's football. Oh, wow. um, That's fantastic. That's great news. <laughs> Yeah. So final two quick questions. Um, what is the motto that you live by? Do you have a motto that you use um, in your life? 
Yeah, I would say that, you know, that that's, that's a, don't say a, a difficult question, but one that is actually easy for me to, to answer. I think my motto is just never stop learning. It, I think you can sort of fool yourself that you can strive to become as good as you can at anything, but that will never be the end. Uh, and I've learned to embrace that rather than actually think that, you know, I want to become absolutely amazing at something. I want to be good at my job. I want to be good at uh, the sport that I'm going to learn. But uh, I'm constantly looking for things to learn, whether uh, there's a personal level or professional level. So I think as long as I'm learning, then I'm happy and I'm challenging myself and I'm keeping my body and my mind engaged uh, and my spirit as well. Fantastic. And last quick question, where are you speaking from today? From home. <laughs> so still working from home. Uh, and I, I think this will be the case for quite a while. Uh, I'm one of those people that happened to very recently. Uh, I wasn't exactly a work from home type of person, perhaps due to, you know, old values in a way. Uh, I would maybe well, once every two weeks or so, maybe even three, not go to the office and work from home. I just used to find it more distracting for some weird reason. But uh, obviously COVID has completely changed that. Uh, and uh, I actually, uh, I normally commute for about one and a half hour to get into the office every day for my house. So needless to say, uh, I'm finding it a, a, a complete blessing to be able to, to be working from home uh, and in a way be even more effective than I was before because I'm not wasting three hours of my day simply traveling, hopping from train to train. So, and home is in London. Thank you, Caroline. A, a fascinating quick introduction to Caroline and her uh, a, a couple of her highlights so far. Uh, so sit back, everyone, relax. Now we're going to get into the more leisurely part of the conversation. Caroline, you have been in the media business since you started your career. What was it that initially interested you to go into media and then make such an amazing career out of the media business? Oh, thanks for the compliment. Uh, I, I actually come from a family that... Um, found salvation through obtaining degrees. I think it's a way of, uh, of describing this. So both my parents come from, came from very poor backgrounds uh, where um, things could have gone completely differently for them should they not have gone to university uh, and got degrees. So my mother uh, went from being you know, a single mom uh, of three by the age of 19 to then deciding to go to university at that age, even though she had three children, she got a degree in law. Uh, and she managed to sort of make a career for myself. And then had another two of us, we are five in total, while doing her degree uh, and managed to do quite well. And then same thing for my dad, uh, also came from a very poor background. He was actually an orphan. Uh, my The woman who I call my grandmother who raised him uh, was a very poor woman who sort of used up all her savings to be able to, to afford his education, which in Brazil is generally um, something that you have to pay for privately. And my dad went and studied medicine as well and, and managed to make a, a good life for himself. So there was a lot of expectations for my family that to do well in life, you have to do one or two things, <laughs> either law or medicine. And if you're not doing law or medicine, then you've got no chance in life. So uh, I always knew from the beginning that even though, you know, that those two uh, particular careers uh, are something that can propel you in life to do much better, even if the odds are against you, I knew that that wasn't something I wanted to do. Uh, I always had a passion uh, for film and the media. Uh, I was always interested how things would work. I'll be completely honest to start with, I wasn't really sure what I would end up doing, something that was more on the operation side of things and more technical or more creative. Uh, when I came to the UK, originally to do this English course, one of the things I wanted to do was to be able to see what opportunities were out there because the media in Brazil at that stage wasn't that great either. Uh, and I also wasn't sure whether I wanted to go into film and TV. So I initially did a BTEC in media production to be able to bridge the gap between my degree uh, that I will be attained in Brazil and a BA in the UK, because obviously we don't have A-levels and that kind of thing. And that was a combination of um, radio, television, photography, design, all things put together to almost like give you a taster for two years 
uh, and to allow uh, young adults to then make a decision for what they might want to do, either to follow a profession or, or a BA, a three-year degree in any of those choices. And then for me, it was very clear that TV is what I wanted to do. So my BA was actually in film and TV. I sort of wanted to do both and sort of uh, towards the end of the degree, you end up specializing in one area or another. For me, it was very clear that uh, I took a shine to post-production uh, and I wasn't really, even though everyone was fighting over the directing jobs and, you know, the all of the exciting stuff where you get credits on screen. For me, what I was really passionate about was just sort of walk around in the background and thinking about how we're going to pull all the equipment together to work or, or how we take that content uh, from the tapes that we used back then or the film mags. Uh, into a media where it can be pulled together to be able to tell a story and then uh, how we consume that content afterwards. So that was kind of the journey. So there was a desire there, well, first against family odds, that then uh, ended up leading to, to, uh, to a degree. And now, of course, you work in sports and media. And I have to say, it's fabulous to see a, a senior woman working at the zone and working in the sports broadcast world. How did you end up in this sports role? I was actually um, invited to join the zone um, when I when I was still working at ITV at the time. Uh, I did sort of have a moment. We can talk about that in a sec when I went into the second but at the ZPP that I initially joined ICV working at the London Studios and then did my second at the ZPP while the studios were closing and then came back to ICV to work in a sort of change management type of role. And then I was approached by my now line manager, Claire, who I used to work with at ITV. So uh, in the beginning for me, the, the move to sport wasn't too, too, too scary, let's put it that way, because during my time at, at the London Studios, especially uh, particularly around the time that we were closing the studios, ITV Sport became the main client. So I already had some experience working in sport. Uh, that was one of the, the biggest productions that we used to cater for. But also, uh, even though obviously there are stigmas around women working in sport, we know that it's not as popular uh, as some of the uh, other uh, production areas. Uh, I was hired by a woman, a woman that I worked with before and that I really believed in. Uh, and who I had these conversations with, you know, what is it like to work in a pure sport uh, uh, company? And for me personally, I'm passionate about content. I'm about passionate about the process of getting content out to, to uh, consumers. And I think that the sport consumer uh, is potentially one of the most rewarding consumers to cater for, for that reason. Because there you're talking about real fanatics. They absolutely love the stuff they are consuming. So for me, it was a, a, an easy sell combined with a very exciting project that, uh, that Claire told me about as well, uh, which was virtual production. Um, we can talk more about that if you like in, in detail, but it was almost like a, a, an opportunity that was impossible to say no to, uh, given what it represents. So um, virtual production, it was essentially, is essentially, because we are doing it, it's become a reality now and it's actually become the new normal in the zone. Um, a way of being able to centralize production resources so that we are able to launch uh, in new territory more, territories more quickly by um, centralizing backends in one location and making those accessible to all of our production teams, either in facility uh, or working remotely on location or even from home at the moment, um, by offering uh, sort of generic equipment uh, around monitors, keyboard and mouse, where you're able to tap into the centralized backends uh, from any location. So what that did is allowed us to launch new territories much more quickly than we did before. And it also enabled us to, to launch the concept of the zone anywhere. And needless to say, that has been absolutely critical and fundamental to help us get ahead of the game uh, during COVID. Yes, of course. And absolutely, in, in when I think about your career, the two things that, that uh, stand out for me are uh, the words transformation and innovation. So wonderful to hear that you came to DAZN to work on virtual production, which, as you say, is very um, topical at this time and was uh, very good planning by Claire and the other team that brought you on board. So <laughs> congratulations on that foresight. Um, what other innovative projects are you working on now with DAZN that you can share with our listeners? 
I think now is uh, post-COVID or even in COVID. I think it's, uh, it, it might be hard to say post-COVID at this stage because we're not completely all out of the woods yet. Um, I think it's obviously when we when we started this year, 2020, what we had in our pipeline was completely different to what we're looking at now. Uh, it, it's been a real eye-opener for flexibility and being able to react very quickly. Uh, doing what I do, which is basically change and transformation, I think I couldn't think of a better time to be able to, uh, to use some of this knowledge. So what do I mean by this? When you work in transformation management, you have to sort of almost detach yourself from previous achievements. You have to kind of work really hard to deliver the, the business vision uh, at the point that that's the project that you need to do, but you also need to constantly review what you've just done uh, and look at the relevance of what's been achieved uh, to see if it's still delivering the business the, the strategy. Uh, and also to look at the pressures uh, around you uh, in the outside world to see if what you set out to do is still valid. So in a non-COVID environment, because of investment uh, and also uh, various other business pressures, uh, a transformation manager doesn't always have the ability to do that. You kind of have to stick with what you've delivered for quite a while because the investment is there and you need to work and you're tied up to a contract. So I think we all, not just transformation managers, I think all businesses, all of us collectively, we all have an opportunity now to use COVID uh, as, uh, as an excuse or, or an opportunity really to look at what you set out to do in 2020 or how you've been working so far and, and see whether that's still relevant. Uh, and also jump in there and get the business backing to be able to change things uh, if it looks like you have to be thinking differently. So I think this is an opportunity not only for those that are running operations, but also for suppliers to start looking at the tools and services they've put out in the market and see whether they are still fulfilling uh, the needs uh, of their clients. So I, so I urge all of the suppliers that are on this webinar, if there's anybody out there, please start having those partnerships uh, with your clients. I know that we already all work like that anyway, and we've been doing more so uh, since we started being less CapEx driven uh, and more SaaS and PaaS and all of those business models that are more flexible. But now more than ever, I think it's time for us to get our heads together in the industry, uh, review what we set out to do. Is still still valid? Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. You know, there may be further COVID restrictions. So the time is now to, to sort of try and improve processes and workflows um, going forward. And what we've heard from the media and sports business is that the global pandemic has accelerated changes that we were already looking at, but now there's been a change in investment or change in priorities that really have accelerated um, innovation and transformation. So um, a very interesting uh, past three months for all of us in the business. And a lot of people who have had to pivot very quickly uh, both to survive and to thrive in sports. Uh, going back to your current role, a head of operational delivery at the zone. For myself and for the people on the uh, webinar, can you explain what head of operational delivery does and what were the skill sets and attributes that you think were uh, important for you to be able to move from your initial role in the zone into this uh, new leadership position. So yeah, sure, I can explain that what head of operational delivery does. So when I was when I was initially hired uh, by the zone by Claire it was to initially do a twelve month contract. So my job title has kind of remained the same, but the remit was mainly volume production driven. So I think what the delivery of that project uh, did do is prove that there is a value in having uh, a department that is focused on bridging the gap uh, between the PMO, between a project department, uh, and the operational areas that actually do the day-to-day. -day. So as you can imagine, a project of that magnitude, so we're talking about facilities in four different locations, plus all of the remote um, uh, capabilities out there, uh, it's not something that people can do and still deliver in the day job. You need to be completely focused. Uh, and also, when you are relying solely on project effort to be doing that kind of thing, uh, sometimes there is a gap where you need the expertise in operations to be able to understand uh, what you're setting out to do, what you're being delivered, uh, and also to be able to speak the language that project people do and also the operations people do. Uh, and also uh, an expertise in dealing with suppliers to be able to communicate the decision and, and track the deliverables to ensure that everything's being done in time. So uh, what 
my role is now a department. We are a department called operational delivery. So I've got a team of delivery managers uh, and workflow managers that are highly capable. So I do not take all the credit for this because I'm, I'm very well supported uh, by some very intelligent and capable people uh, now in this department. Uh, what we do is look at everything that the business sets out to do uh, across the entire supply chain from our content creation to acquisition and distribution in terms of projects. Before a project is even a project, we look at the strategy, the business strategy. Like, for example, we're looking at a number of things at the moment, including uh, how do we enhance production value? You know, do we still need a traditional gallery or do we want to do it remotely somewhere? Or do we want a hybrid of both? So we deal with everything from the beginning where we support the delivery of the business strategy uh, initially as a document that then gets shared with our senior leaders, uh, and it gets sense tracked. You know, we ensure that we have business alignment and then once a project is approved, we then support the project management and the operational areas uh, in the delivery of the project end to end from gathering requirements to uh, ensuring that the delivery is uh, still hitting, uh, for example, competition, key competition timelines, which are really important. So we almost the glue that pulls everybody together, uh, also liaise with several suppliers and so on to be able to ensure the smooth delivery of those projects, no matter how big and small. So in essence, what we do is uh, also look at tools and services that have already been deployed to ensure that, that uh, if there are opportunities for improvement, those are being factored in and that we are delivering the change that is required. Fantastic, thank you. Um, one, one interesting thing for me is that you've worked uh, in many blue chip media companies, including ITV, uh, the DPP, which many of us are also members of, and now at DAZN. Um, through your career, what, what would you say have been some of your career highlights so far, either in your previous companies or in your current role? Uh, career highlights. I think there are a number of things. I think it's worth saying that um, it's something that I don't normally put on my CV, <laughs> that I actually had the opportunity to run my own business um, from about 2007, I believe, for a while, for quite a few years, for about five years. And, uh, and I'll explain how it got me to the peaks at the moment. So I, my partner at the time uh, was originally from South Africa, and there was an opportunity uh, to start the resellership uh, in a bureau of a 3D printing business back in 2007, where 3D printing wasn't something that was popular at all. Nowadays, you have 3D printers that, um, that work from home and, and, and various other things that are much more affordable. Back then was cutting edge technology. And even though my passion absolutely is content and how we make it and how we get it out to people, there was an opportunity at a stage of my career when I was freelancing and, uh, and I was making enough money and all that, but I wasn't, I had an opportunity to actually try something new, which is not every day that it happens in life because you're either on a trajectory and you don't want to stop or, <clears throat> or whatever that is. So for me, um, it was an opportunity to stop what I was doing, dip my toes into something completely different. So I moved into South Africa with my partner. We set up this business. It was really interesting to see how transferable skills are so important. Because even though my uh, my skills at that point were content making, uh, it was post production, uh, it was distribution, whatever I also been doing up until that point, uh, I very easily, obviously, going on training courses and understanding how those machines work, I was able to set up a, a bureau to be able to run the services. I had to learn 3D card drawing, and uh, what I became really good at as well, which is absolutely insane, was the architecture side of things. So I had to learn CADs, as in looking at uh, 2D drawings with measurements and everything, uh, and learning a tool at the time called SolidWorks that uh, was mainly used for engineering to be able to convert those 2D CAD drawings into 3D. And even though the work that I was doing was quite basic, I used to sort of pass it on to other people to be able to, to make it at uh, full bells and whistles and add all the detail. It was something that I never thought I could do. I also became quite good at uh, learning how to run the machine. So at some point, even though I was the owner of the business, I was also going out to teach people how to run these huge machines that were about two meters by, uh, by three meters long uh, and turning up in places like universities uh, and automotive factories to show uh, large groups of men how to use these beasts uh, when I was only like in my late 20s uh, as I was interesting. 
So um, why was that experience so important? Um, what it has given me is a tool that's been absolutely essential to my work ethic, which is the ability to uh, look at what I need to do, look at my deliverables, look at what's required from me from a complete 360 perspective. And by that, I mean possibly every axis, up, down, left, right, uh, all in all encompassing, when I'm no longer just thinking about uh, what is expected of me, but also what is good for the business. Because that's what something that I had to learn, not being a business owner before. So every step, every decision, uh, everything is just constantly looking, you know, how does this, how will this serve me commercially? Uh, how will this serve me operationally? Uh, how will this uh, improve my relationships with my suppliers and my clients? And having done that for five years, it's kind of engraved in me. And and when I ended up coming back to the UK eventually, due to um, business was successful for quite a while, but due to the uh, financial crisis 2009, 2010, it then became really difficult and it made more sense to look for job security uh, and, and work for an employer. Uh, I had to take quite a, a junior job at ITV to start with, which for me was really humbling. But that that lesson of having that sort of work ethic and mindset never left me. So it was very, it was much easier for me to have a really clear game plan to promote myself and just kind of sit down the background, uh, learning everything about television again, uh, and uh, about being able to do things that's slightly different. And I think uh, I was fortunate enough that that strong work ethic managed to shine through and on the back of that opportunities uh, arisen uh, and I was able to quite quickly um, work my way up from that. Thank you. And you've also done an uh, interesting combination of both freelance work, uh, secondment work and full-time roles. Mm -hmm. For many of the young women on the call who are thinking about their careers, can you share a little bit of difference between the freelance parts of your career and the full time and why uh, the why it's been great for your career to do a little bit of both? Yeah, sure. It's very important when, when you talk back to me and you remind me what I've done. You are absolutely right. I think I pretty much tried every modality <laughs> of working out there. So I've been a business owner, I've been an employee, I've been a freelancer, I've been a secondman. Uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, for me, it's all about always learning and always trying new things. Uh, I think the same way that transformation management work on a business plan, you have to create enough data points for lack of a better working life to be able to look back and, and, and join the dots uh, and be able to project good for the future. So for me, having had a, a go at doing all of those things and working all of those different ways, it's all about that. It's actually trying things to be able to see what works out for me. So I'm going to focus on the, the freelancing thing for now. So how did I start freelancing? So I, I was very fortunate that my I started running in the very beginning of my career when I did the BTEC, and that was really useful because even though um, it was only a, a, a short opportunity before I even did my degree, it kind of opened my eyes for what it's like to get an entry job uh, in the industry. So when I finished my degree, uh, I then could only get a job as a runner again because we all know that uh, that is what happens in the media industry. It's, you know, we all have to start that way. Uh, to be completely honest, at the time, I was actually warned by the uh, my employer during the BTEC. He said to me, do you, are you sure you want to go and do a degree in media? It's much easier to just stay doing your placement. <laughs> and in three years' time, if you do your degree, you can only get the job that you have now. But if you stay here, you could be someone. And he was absolutely right, because even though you know, I wrote wonderful dissertations at university, and I learned how to use uh, the equipment that they have over there, and I don't regret it, it was useful. Uh, that's exactly what happened. When I finished my degree, I had to go and get a job as a runner. So I, uh, during university, had to do several catering jobs as well uh, to be able to make ends meet. Uh, at that stage, uh, now I am, but I wasn't a British citizen, meaning that my education had to be privately funded and there was no grant. So I had to work really hard to be able to make all that work. So uh, what really helped me quickly get promoted from runner to tech. Uh, I always like to talk about this because I think it's important. It wasn't necessarily the degree, but it was the work ethic. <laughs> because having done so many catering jobs, if anything, me to, taught me to, to show up for it. 
So while some of the other runners that had just finished university, they hadn't had the experience that I had before when I knew what running was about, was making a lot of teas and running around and, and doing all these things that we all had to do, I was prepared for that. And also I was used to serving people, you know, so I kind of just showed up for it, understanding what it was about. Uh, and, and very easily people could see the work ethic and they offered those opportunities to grow. So my time as a runner after uni was only about a month. So very quickly learn how to, uh, more about tech. At the time, my job was more tech operations driven uh, than it is now, which is mainly transformation. And that is what I learned to do. So at the time that expertise was actually uh, quite unusual for women to do because it's, you know, routers were not digital. You used to have to walk around carrying massive looms of patch cables that were actually quite heavy around your neck and you had to go and, uh, and use all the patch, patch boards. Even in post-production, you know, the, the, the concept of using uh, an ISA storage wasn't there either. So we're quite frequently running up and down with a whole stack of SCSI drives. So it was a tough job for a woman to do. So and I became, uh, I would like to say, pretty good at it. Uh, it took me a couple of years. I applied myself. I remember at the time the... the um, skill that was in demand the most and paid better was doing conforms, uh, tape conforms in those massive Sony edit controllers. And I used to stay late and learn from the guys who were much more senior than me how to do that, and I did. And I knew that if it was hard for me to break through uh, within the company, uh, in terms of being offered a more senior full-time job, I could then walk away uh, and do those tape conforms for a living and maybe earn about two, three times more money there than I was earning. So would I have freelance if the opportunities were there? Uh, maybe the answer would have been no. Uh, but at the time, again, uh, giving a senior job in a machine room, as they used to call those sort of jobs back then, for a woman was quite unusual because it was actually quite physically uh, taxing. There were women, but not as much as there are before. Uh, and I think there's also a lesson that should be learned uh, about uh, the importance of creating opportunities for people of diverse background, whether they are women uh, or whether uh, it's... Um, uh, ethnicity, or whatever is through, so that we can business can work consciously uh, in breaking those unconscious bias that are there. Uh, where I think maybe I think that that issue is still there, but where people are scared to sort of put uh, a person who wouldn't normally be your first choice for the role uh, in a role of or of, of, of more management experience and so on. So what my employers at the time said suggested, uh, and I was extremely grateful for that, is that I came back as a freelancer because they could pay me much better. <laughs> and that's what I did. So I started the freelancing for my same employers, uh, maybe earning about twice or three times what I was earning before, because those roles are not there. So this is how I got into freelancing. Uh, having said all this, while I was freelancing, maybe because of the nature of my personality, even though the money was really good, uh, I really did miss having those opportunities for career progression. Uh, even though the freelance work paid really well, it was very saley. Uh, and also it didn't, it didn't allow me to get my, my claws involved. You know, I want, I miss going to, to, to bed thinking about work and waking up, thinking about work as crazy as this sounds. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, you, you've also been able to, uh, break a lot of barriers, as you said before, a barrier to be a, a woman in the media business, a barrier to be a diverse woman in the media business. Um, but yet you've not only been in media as a young woman, you've managed to stay and thrive in the media business and get promoted. So for us at Rise, it's not enough just to attract women to the media and broadcast business. Our mission is really to try and create those conditions where women stay in the business and then rise to the top of the sports and broadcast and, um, and media companies. So, of course, along the way, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, how have you been able to address and recover from those challenges to be a woman who's really survived and thrived in, in the media biz? Thank you. That's a really good question. I think it's, you know, it's been ongoing. Um, I, uh, there are two things I wanted to address. First is the concept of the glass ceiling, and then I want to talk about the power of mentoring, because I think those two things are, are really important. Uh, and if you can be supported by a mentor to be able to, to, to almost let go of that concept of the glass ceiling, uh, then you're in a really good position. And I think that's kind of what, what happened to me 
uh, by my own design and also by support by a wonderful mentor that we'll talk about in a sec. So in my personal experience, I kind of, you know, the glass ceiling is real. Uh, and by that, I mean when you cannot attain uh, what you see in front of you, despite your, your suitability and your best efforts. So it's real, but it's limiting and it's also really discouraging. So I think if you are in a situation where you've, you've been blocked from getting what you want, uh, I think the best thing to do is to kind of change your mindset. You know, there's nothing blocking you. Sometimes the circumstances are limiting, but I think it's really important that you take ownership of your own career break uh, by making your intention to grow uh, known to those that can really help you. So be vocal about your ambition uh, and show the results to be able to back up uh, the support that you need from people as well. So by that, I mean, make yourself visible, uh, stand out from the norm, uh, aim to deliver above and beyond. And I think you do have to go a, a beyond suitability for a role as well. Uh, if you are not the usual candidate, they would normally get the job if you see what I mean. Uh, and so that you actually inspire the candidates that may be seeing uh, favorites to actually try and up their game and match. <laughs> so this is not actually not easy. It, it's hard work and it's, and it's ongoing. I think for every woman or for every person of a diverse background, but it's also exciting. So what you need to do is, again, talking about breaking the unconscious bias, you have to get, think, pe get people thinking about um, taking a risk with you because the opportunity that you offer is just too good to miss, if you see what I mean, because it's hard for those hiring as well. You know, as a hiring manager, I'm sure that a lot of people relate to this. You're looking at CVs and you think, okay, I actually like the sound of person, but how is this going to get seen in my organization? You know, this is quite a common thing uh, when it comes to technical jobs uh, and hiring women or even people of diverse background as well. So, and of course, the above and beyond will only come with hard work. There's no easy way to get there. It's quite often having to think about work in your spare time while everyone else is chilling at home with their families. But having said all this, and I would like to make this point because it's really clear, it's actually really important. If you've made your intentions clear and you're going above and beyond and no one is noticing and what you're doing, then it's time to move on and it's time to find opportunities elsewhere. Because it's, it's always possible to get what you want and what you deserve. You just need to have a clear plan. And most important, know your markers for success as well so you know when to move on if the actual effort is actually being wasted. So it's kind of, you know, setting those parameters up front and, and kind of really listening uh, to make sure that um, am I getting somewhere with this? Because opportunity exists everywhere. You just have to be really attuned to seeing those markers for am I progressing or is this actually a waste of time for me? Thank you. And you have been a strong believer in mentoring throughout your career, both being a mentee and a mentor. Can you share how mentoring has helped you in your career and maybe call out a couple of the key people who have, uh, you know, pushed you along in your journey? Yeah, sure. I would love to do that. You're absolutely right. I, I absolutely believe in mentor mentoring. I think all of the things I described about breaking the glass ceiling and learning uh, your markers, what you're going in life. Uh, they uh, they work much more easily if you have somebody actually be enabled, uh, enabling you to see yourself through the eyes of a mentor, if you see what I mean, because then they can remind you of your value. I think for some of us, they are trying to get a career break in life. Sometimes if you're being beaten too hard, you start questioning yourself, you know, why is this not happening for me? So mentoring is really important for that reason. If you, do, if you, if you have somebody that you look up to and you see how they've done it in life, and for us women, I think there are great examples out there, and I really take my hat off to rise for creating these opportunities for people. Uh, you'll be able to see how they've done it. They'll be able to advise you on how to do it. And most important, they'll be able to also remind you about your value. You know, they'll be able to have those conversations and kind of say, yeah, this sounds like it might really work. Or have you thought about uh, perhaps trying something else? Uh, and for me, even my secondment opportunity, for example, uh, sort of came on the back of uh, conversations that, that I had uh, with my then mentor, uh, Helen Stevens, who is absolutely amazing, one of my favorite people uh, in life, uh, who has been an amazing mentor to me uh, during the time that I was at ITV. I was looking at all options and she said, you know, here's an opportunity for you to go and investigate. And then obviously I reached out to the DPP and I said, here I am, this is the skill set that I've got. I've learned that uh, that could potentially be an opportunity. Could we make it work and could it be a second? You know, things that I wouldn't normally think about that are there. So this is, uh, this is why it's so important uh, having had that support. Uh, and for me, uh, it's something that I've always done as well. 
uh, even though I wasn't directly involved in mentoring programs, even was at my most junior job at, at ITV, when my job had absolutely nothing to do with mentoring, uh, I took it upon myself to start sort of teaching others because I was working with people who are much younger than me, uh, whatever I could, so empowering those that wanted to make a break. In fact, mentoring for me is so important that I've taken that beyond uh, my professional life. Last year, for example, I got involved, uh, not the year before, with uh, an organization called Chance UK, where I had the opportunity to mentor a vulnerable child for 18 months, uh, which uh, involved, uh, obviously, lots of background checks and training uh, to be able to do something called solution focus approach, uh, where you're working with a child that really is in need uh, and maybe with some traumas in life, uh, seeing that child every weekend and help them see what's best in themselves and how to manage the circumstances around them, even though they can't change them. So um, cannot support the work that RISE is doing enough. I think this is absolutely fantastic. And and I encourage everybody uh, that is on this call, those that are already not involved in some sort of mentoring, to take part in it, either as a mentee or a mentor. I think it's uh, really important to share knowledge. Thank you. And beyond um, yourself, of course, there's a lot of uh, amazing women who work at the zone, uh, some of whom I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of working with. So I think of Georgina Owens, who is your head of IT, Sarah Milburn and Claire Downey, who work on the WTA, um, Marie Ingham, who works in legal, uh, a lot of extremely inspiring women. Oh, I can't forget my good friend, Kieran Mann, who uh, is a powerhouse at DAZN. Uh, so DAZN seems to really have a lot of very uh, strong and in inspiring women. Is there a formal program to support women in DAZN, or is it more of an informal uh, mentoring and uh, support program? I think I think we're very good at uh, sort of empowering women both uh, off platform and on platform. So let's talk about uh, off platform first. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. You've named some really powerful women that we work for. Uh, you know, our product sits at the intersection of women in sport and technology, and we are really passionate about championing our females, employees, and industry leaders. Uh, all the names that you called out are, are absolutely fantastic women that have made a lot of change. I also would like to call out uh, my online manager, Claire Da Silva, as well, uh, for being a woman that is making a lot of change within the business. I really believe in what she's doing, so uh, let's include Claire in that as well, because I think it's really important. Uh, and also, uh, on platform, uh, I would like to, to call out some of the initiatives that we've been doing. Uh, so we started working with uh, a global children's charity called Plan International in 2013. So we initially was to do uh, uh, an initiative in India, but then since 2017, this partnership uh, of empowerment through sport uh, is now working uh, with institutions in Brazil, and that is using football to train young people to challenge gender equality and to become agents of change. So uh, over three years, the project has helped just under 2,000 young people, which is absolutely amazing, tackling gender inequality and also gender-based discrimination and violence, uh, and also looking at the lack of opportunities for girls to play sport. In Brazil, that's still a major problem, uh, which is actually quite sad. For example, uh, it's, I just want to talk about Brazil a little bit here, being my, my home country. Uh, in European countries in America, where female football, it's, it's highly regarded and people get paid well in Brazil, you'll be shocked that that's not quite the case, even though we have, uh, for quite a while, the best player in the world, which is absolutely shocking. So also, um, last year, well, employees had the opportunity to visit the project in Teresina, the northeast of Brazil, and to see the impact uh, of the charity work so far. So uh, the initiative has helped refurbished uh, eight football pitches to create safe spaces for young people and also established 17 football teams across the community. In addition to the corporate effort um, um, sponsorship element, our employees are also really passionate about this initiative and they're committed to supporting uh, the plan for fundraisers. Uh, one of the key highlights being the cycling called Do the Plan, which is an, an annual uh, staff-led cycling initiative uh, last year from Paris to Madrid, uh, supported uh, by our own people, by our own employees. So that, that's been absolutely amazing. So with regards to diversity on platform, uh, the zone uh, is proud to provide a platform for women in sport. So we've frequently shown premium sports, uh, sports uh, women's sport across a variety of events, including uh, martial arts, boxing, soccer, and tennis. And then, of course, we also have uh, our partnership with the WTA as well. 
Um, and that is something that we will carry on doing. So we also have an, a diverse on-screen talent roster. For example, uh, our change up presenter, uh, Lara Gardner, uh, and also uh, Diletta in Italy uh, being a key uh, on-screen personality. So I'm very proud of the work that they've been doing to champion women in sport. Yeah, and uh, this year we have a RISE mentee as part of our RISE program from uh, DAZN, Rosanna Prada, who is based in, in uh, Northern England and works as a broadcast engineer. So uh, not sure if Rosanna is on the call today, but uh, she's been a fantastic addition to our uh, mentee program this year. Um, and then the final question from me before we move on to the questions from the audience. Um, where do you see your career going from here? What are you looking forward to next? What are you still hoping to learn? And for you personally and professionally, what do you think is uh, going to happen? Okay, very good questions. I think it, it can be quite daunting to make career plans uh, during during a pandemic when, to be honest, quite a lot of us are uh, worried about job security and various other things. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, I think right now is a fantastic opportunity uh, for people to do what I do work-wise, which is to review processes uh, and think about uh, how we want to look like as a business, what does success look like in this new normal. So uh, I would love to be able to explore that uh, further. I think there's a window of opportunity here to make some really interesting things happen. So this is what's getting my creative juices and my, uh, my interest at the moment. And, and I'm hoping to, uh, to milk this opportunity as much as possible. Uh, to be able to to drive change uh, and and work with my colleagues uh, to to make the zone look like uh, as, as smart as possible, as lean as possible, and to be able to deliver the stuff that we set out to do in the beginning of the year, maybe just differently, which is to increase utilization, become more flexible, uh, and uh, and be able to enhance our content. Uh, for less uh, and more creatively. <laughs> so that's kind of the plan. And then for me personally, I. Just like I'm constantly reinventing myself at work, I'm also constantly reinventing myself personally as well. So this year, again, as I said, I became vegan. So I'm toying with doing sports for the first time. So I'll carry on uh, trying that. I had a motorcycle accident about five years ago, which has sort of put me in a position where I thought I would never be able to do sport. But now I'm jogging. So I'm, it, it sounds probably really obvious for somebody who's been doing sports for a while. So for me, it's baby steps. But I'm so excited about this. So for me, it's all about working out on my body. I already do quite a lot of meditation whenever I have a chance. So my mind and my spirit are kind of not doing too bad. So my body, I think, it needed some improvement. I think I'm finally getting that. So it's kind of uh, being able to, to think about my well-being holistically. Uh, and I have no doubt that that will help me get through uh, everything post-COVID, either work-wise or personal life or whatever it means. Uh, more nicely. So that's what I, I'm sort of aiming for. More meditation, more sport, better eating. I've already cut down the alcohol about two years ago. <laughs> so I'll carry on with my mini projects. My partner says that soon we run out of things to give up, but that's not a bad thing. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that insight into what you're thinking about uh, for the future. Always very interesting for our um, audience to hear. So now moving to the questions from the audience, quite a few coming in, but there are many further ones. Uh, I'm going to start with Rosanna Prada, who is on the call. Welcome, Rosanna. And Rosanna asks, Caroline, you mentioned that your interests in TV and film were both in the technical and creative side. Was there anything that made you choose a career path on the more operations side of post-production and content creation management versus the engineering side. Was there anything you experienced earlier in your career that shaped that decision? That's a really good question, Rosanna. And it's actually a really interesting one because you know, when I was very young, I, I had to tell myself whether I should, should choose engineering or whether I should choose uh, more of a media production uh, side. And, uh, and for a while, when I started working in machine rooms and I became very techy, I did kind of ask myself, you know, will I ever be successful without an engineering degree to be able to back this up? But then what I learned along the way is that I actually love uh, working with people. 
And I'm not saying that engineers don't, but it's just a different skill set. And it's, you know, engineers are busy sort of pulling together uh, um, processes on the background to come up with really interesting and clever solutions. And people who do what I do right now is, it's almost like bridging that gap between the really clever people who pull the solution together and being able to communicate uh, the business vision to those clever people and also communicate the engineering vision back to the business. And I found that uh, later in life, that even though, yes, for a while, I did regret maybe not having done a technical degree like engineering, I do actually love being that sort of agent of change in the middle. So I think somehow life was kind enough to me to put, put me exactly what I need to be and what I can offer the most value. Thank you. Uh, next question. What do you think is most exciting about sports broadcasting at the moment? I would think, I think the opportunities to be able to do things in a much leaner way right now is what is really exciting. Because obviously sports fans are very demanding, uh, and so they should be because they're absolutely fascinated about what they love, which is sport. Um, I think up until now, if you think about adding production value to a feed, it would have to really invest quite a lot of money uh, also in, in travel uh, and expenses to be able to get people up to site. And then now we have the opportunity to work with things like, you know, eventually 5G uh, and IP to be able to, to acquire things in any location much more easily. And then if you work your way down the supply chain, we're also able to add production value much more easily. I think we're still learning that. Uh, we know that now we no longer need to have everybody sat in the same control room and gallery to be able to create something interesting. Now you can have people split all over the world uh, creating a, a really interesting piece of content. Uh, and that the speed in which we can make content available as well has become absolutely astonishing. Now we can get the action out there pretty quickly uh, in really good quality to be consumed uh, in, in much more um, devices that, that we used to be able to in the past. So I think agility is, is what's making things really exciting. And ultimately, the goal is to be able to get really good content out to more people uh, in the flavor that they want, i.e. to be able to localize so that it's relevant and, and we get more eyeballs on our content, right? And I think this is where we're going at the moment. I think we're being... In a way, we're finding the gray area where we are maintaining a good, en good enough sort of uh, standard of quality, but also making production values more affordable so that we can just get more content out there and make it more relevant to more people. Uh, next audience question. It's a, in a similar vein. Where do you think the future of sports broadcasting and sports viewing is going? What would be your top predictions for the next few years in sports media? Okay, so very good question. So I think personalization, I think is definitely one for us to, to look out for. Uh, as content consumers are becoming more demanding, and I think, I know I keep saying this, but I really do believe that personalization will drive the changes in the entire content uh, supply chain, right? To get the right content out to people, you have to change the way that you acquire it, the way that you enhance it, and the way that you distribute it. So if I think that if there is one thing that can't be, needs to be looked at now and, um, and taken seriously, but holistically, not just about how the content is being consumed, but also what kind of content you have to get out to people, I would say is personalization and everything else will follow. Thank you. And last question. This is one that I particularly like. What does success look like for you in your career? And has it changed during the pandemic? What does success look like for my career? Okay. So, okay, I'm probably going to end, end with a, a, an interesting one. But I'm normally thriving when I'm at the end of myself. So it's for me coming in and doing the same job and just kind of, you know, uh, sort of bread and butter. Uh, even though it's very comfortable, it's not what drives me. It's not what makes me happy. So it's uh, success for me means being constantly being challenged and, and also uh, working for a company that champions that. Uh, I know that not, not all businesses see things that way. So I think I'm very fortunate to be working in the zone where I'm supported by a, a, a team and a business area that basically is there to do that to review processes uh, and to uh, carry on improving. So uh, I'm, I'm in a good place to be doing what I need to do. So 
what success will look like post-COVID, you, you're absolutely right. I think what we set out to do as a department at the beginning of the year uh, was very different to what it is now. That success means uh, having the courage to review everything we're doing uh, and to be able to uh, change the processes that need to be changing and actually to take people through the path of change and maybe, you know, raise a flag here and there where possible and say, you know what, we need to change our approach to how we're living things right now, even if it means having to go back to the drawing board uh, and challenging previous successes that we achieved in the past. So it does look different, but ultimately uh, the, the, the ethos is still that uh, for me, which is what does success look like? It's being able to drive change, drive transformation, and improve the way people do their jobs. Thank you. And was there anything in the pandemic that shifted or changed your view of success or maybe accelerated it? Uh, I would say yes. I think we've learned that uh, we audiences are probably more forgiving than we thought. Uh, I don't know whether during the pandemic, whether it would be possible to be uh, working with sort of lower quality content uh, that you would do if you're not in a pandemic, but this is not what you're setting out to achieve because quality is absolutely important. But I think it's being able to embrace more, to be able to embrace a wider range of tools, a wider range of processes, to be able to get the content out there uh, in, in more um, leaner ways than we were in the past. So it's kind of just taking those lessons learned and being able to, to apply them uh, to how we're going to be setting uh, our plans for the next quarters and so on. So I would say, yes, becoming more, becoming leaner and becoming more agile, more efficient still is what we strive to do. It always was from the beginning, but now we maybe we'll just do it a little bit different. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, we have come to the top of the hour. So I just want to say a big thank you to you for sharing your insights, your time, uh, your experiences, your wisdom with the people who, who dialed in. Uh, a real pleasure to get to know a little bit more about you. And we wish you all the very best in your future career. And we'll be watching closely to see what you do next.